The Lord be with you, and welcome to worship this morning with Our Savior's Lutheran Church of Faribault. It's always great to welcome you to this service of prayer and praise and thanksgiving. Welcome. Glad that you are here. Uh, we know that there are those who are finding us online during this pandemic time, and if, if this is your first time worshiping with us, we hope that you'll come on back. If you'd like to find out more about our church, get on our website here in Faribault or give a call to our church office. It would be fun to have a chance to connect with you. And also, just a reminder, if you have needs for pastoral support or prayer, don't hesitate to give a call to the church office and speak with Wendy, who is our receptionist. She'll make sure that that message gets to me so we can follow up. Uh, some things to share with you. Uh, our COVID task force has been meeting, and we've been meeting very diligently over the summer. And based on the numbers that we're seeing in our county and in the surrounding area, the decision has been that we will wait until uh, September is over for sure to gather together for public worship in our sanctuary. Uh, there are all sorts of factors that go into that, but, but please know that we're trying our best to be diligent and to be faithful. But this next Wednesday, uh, that would be Wednesday the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th. Oh, I, what is this next Wednesday? The 9th. Gotcha. Wednesday the 9th. So on Wednesday the 9th, we will be worshiping outdoors, and that'll be at 6 o'clock p.m. on the east lawn of the church. Again, we need you to register for that. You should be receiving both a, a letter in the mail or some sort of announcement by email and know that we'd really like you to come and be a part of that. Uh, as we move forward, just one really great announcement to add to what's happening here. You know that we have indeed hired uh, our, our new interim pastor, Joanne Sorensen. Uh, Lisa Sandgren is stepping in as our interim director of faith formation. And I'm pleased to tell you that as of just last night, today we're recording on, on Thursday, just last night, our, our new youth director came on board. His name is Tyler Burkoff. Tyler is uh, a resident of Illinois. He's worked throughout the nation, actually, doing several camp jobs and also has worked in a Lutheran volunteer course setting in, uh, in the city of, let's see, where was he? Can't remember right now, but it was a good city. <laughs> So uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to welcome Tyler as, as we move forward, but please remember him in your prayers and, and know that now we're back to a full level of staffing. And so thanks for your support and for your patience in that. Uh, we are grateful for the musicians that are sharing our music with us today. Thanks to Mark and to Paula and Mike for our opening prelude. And now they're going to lead us in our opening song, The Church Song. And we're really grateful for their music. Thanks, friends. And we'll continue now with the singing of that song. Thank you. 
Which is not a building that people would have prayed. It's not made out of sticks and stones. It's not made out of clay. Mark and Paula and Mike, and my memory is good, but it's short. It is Omaha. That's where uh, that's where Tyler worked for a time, and so we're really glad to welcome him and remember to keep him and our congregation in our prayers. Let's uh, let's begin our worship together then, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pause for a moment of silence, for reflection, for prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear friends, hear this good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ Jesus was given to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. O God, give us grace to set a good example through what we say and do to be just and true in all our dealings, to, to be honorable and conscientious in the discharge of every duty. As we work in your kingdom, help us answer your call to serve you and your people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we get ready for the children's sermon, I'd like to invite the kids, if you want to get a little bit closer to the screen, perhaps, and we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me like we always do. So let's sing. Jesus loves me, this I know. 
for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Thanks, boys and girls. It's always good to get together with you at times like this. We sure wish we could be doing it in person, and we'll do it as quickly as we possibly can. But for now, for now, I'd like to visit with you about something that I think is really, really important. Now, some of you are pretty little, maybe two or three or four years old, and some of you are a little bit older than that. Maybe, maybe you're actually getting ready to go back to school and really, really excited about that possibility. One of the things that grown-ups will often ask kids is, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's a good question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, I actually know what you will be when you grow up. I know this. It's not because I'm so smart, but it's because I have read the Bible and I've listened to the stories of Jesus my whole life long, and I know this about you. I know that you are going to be a child of God with unique abilities and talents, with things that you can do really, really well and some things that maybe you're not quite so good at. But I know that's who you will be. You will always be a beloved child of God. And so when grown-ups ask us that question, what are you going to be when you grow up? I think the better question would be, what would you like to do? What would you like to do when you grow up? Now, I have a daughter named Sarah. Uh, she is now actually going to graduate school, and she's at the University of Minnesota. And when she was a little girl, she always said, I want to farm like Grandpa Wilbur. That was my grandpa's name, Wilbur. And me, when I was a little kid, I had all sorts of ideas. There was a time where I really, I kid you not, I really wanted to be a cowboy. That's, that's really what I wanted to do. And then after a while, I thought, hmm, I think I would like to be a scientist because I got um, this thing called a chemistry set and a microscope, and it was so cool. And then after I got a little bit older and I started to play in the band at school playing trumpet, I thought, I know what I'll do when I grow up. I would like to be a band director and be a trumpet player. Well, I still play the trumpet, but I, I'm, not, I'm not working as a band director. When I was about, oh, I don't know, in junior high school, my pastor came to me and said, you know what? I wonder if you might have what it takes to be a pastor, to do the work of a pastor. And as the story goes, as I grew up, that's what I have been called to do, and that's what I do for a job. Now, as I said before, I know exactly who you will be when you grow up. You will be a child of God. You will be loved by so many people. You will have all sorts of skills and abilities and talents and things that will bring you great joy and that will make a difference in the world. But the big question is, is what will you do with all of those gifts? Everybody's got to figure it out. I've got a good friend. In fact, he's right here as we're taping. And he is an artist. He is a designer. And when he sits down and uses his brain to put ideas on a screen or on a piece of paper, he does something that I, I simply can't do. And when I see the work that he does, it's, it's amazing to me. Uh, today, you had a chance to hear some wonderful musicians, and they're not done playing yet. I am an okay musician, but the folks that you've heard today, man, they do music really, really well. So one of the things that I'd like to do, and I, I know I can't really give you homework, but if I could, I would invite you to talk to your moms and your dads and your grandpas and your grandpas and maybe, maybe even the people in your life that love you the most and say, hmm, what do you think I'm really good at? What do you think are my abilities or my gifts? Some are really, really great listeners. Some have huge hearts. 
Some are really good at fixing things, like my kid brother. He can fix anything. I've always kind of been a little bit envious of that. Again, I know who you will be, but I don't know what you will do. But I hope and I pray that what you do will be answering God's call to make a good difference in this world. And for right now, for those of you who are little kids, I know exactly what God is calling you to do. He's calling you to be a good brother or sister, a good son or daughter, a good grandchild, a good friend, a good neighbor. And for those of you who are getting ready to go to school to be a good student, in essence, that's your job. That's your calling right now. And I hope that you'll give it everything you've got because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to give our best always. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for, for your love and for making us who we are, your children. And each of us has unique abilities and talents and gifts. Help us then to figure out whether we're old or young or in between, to figure out what we can do with these abilities and talents to make the world better. I know this, that the little kids in my life, the ones I love the most, when they give me a smile or a hug, that makes my day better. When I see them, when I hear them, when I watch them play, I come to understand that they are really a blessing in my life. And I hope the boys and girls that are listening right now will realize that they are a blessing to us too, just by being who they are and by doing what they do. So thank you for these kids and thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. Remember that homework. And moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, maybe you can help out with that a little bit too. This time we're going to continue with the reading of the scripture. We'll be hearing from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. To Houston will be our reader today. And this particular passage of scripture talks about our calling, about our vocation, about what we are called to do with who we are. So listen very carefully as Dick reads about the calling to which you are being called. Thanks, Dick, very much. The reading today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Thanks, Dick, for reading that portion from the letter to the Ephesians written by St. Paul. Uh, today, Sunday, tomorrow, pretty much everybody knows what day is it is tomorrow. It, it's Labor Day. Labor Day. Labor Day is a day set aside to, to honor the value of the worker and the value of work. In this parish, there are folks who do all kinds of work or who have done all kinds of jobs. The other day, somebody told me that he wished he could have been a preacher instead of doing his current job. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, working one day a week really appeals to me. I've heard that one before. Have you heard this one? It, it seems that there was a pastor who was teaching his confirmation class, and the kids, the kids were really sharp. But this particular night, the pastor was struggling to make a connection, doing his best to teach a very important lesson, and it just it wasn't clicking. That night, the pastor was teaching the story from the Old Testament, Testament about Jonah. You, you know the story, right? Jonah, he runs away from the work that God wants him to do, but God eventually catches up with him. Anyway, the pastor quoted the scripture from the book of Jonah, chapters 1 and 2, which reads like this. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, 
I called to the Lord in my distress, and the Lord answered me. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and the fish vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, when the pastor finished sharing that biblical quotation, he was hoping to get some reaction from the class, but nobody had much to say. So he waited for a while, and, and finally he broke the silence, and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, what does the fish vomiting Jonah out on the dry land mean for us, for you and for me today? <laughs> one kid in the back row, probably one of the smartest kids in the class, raised his hand, and he was smiling. He said, You know, Pastor, it just goes to show you that not even a fish can stomach a bad preacher. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually literally heard worse than that. Oftentimes, oftentimes people actually get, get poked at. Good-natured poking, fun, at the work that they do. But sometimes, sometimes the fun that people poke isn't all that good-natured. Sometimes, sometimes the work that people do is, is devalued or disrespected, and it should never be. Do you know how hard it is to be a good nurse? Do you know how hard it is to be a good custodian or a good secretary or a good engineer or a good teacher? Do you know how hard it is to actually be a good fast food worker or a good plumber or a good farmer or a good cashier or a good truck driver or a good mechanic or a good law enforcement officer? Some of us have had those days where we wonder, why we keep doing what we do. Maybe, maybe you've wondered that, especially with regard to your work. And so today, what I would like to do is to kind of pick up where we left off in the children's sermon and talk about, about work, what we are called to do, and how the world looks at work first. But, but more importantly, it, it's important, I think, to see how God looks at the work that we do, how the world looks. You know, there is a, there's really nothing more worldly than, than the World Wide Web. And according to an internet website called HowStuffWorks.com, and by the way, kids, if you're still listening, HowStuffWorks.com is a great place to, to spend a little time. Anyway, I got on the website and I read what it said about Labor Day. And this is a direct quote. It says, for a lot of people, Labor Day means two things, a day off and the end of summer. But... Do you know why it's called Labor Day? Labor Day is a day set aside to pay tribute to working men and women, and it's actually been celebrated as a national holiday in the U.S. since 1894. Labor unions themselves celebrated the very first Labor Days in the U.S. Historians, historians credit this guy named Peter McGuire, a leader of the Carpenters Union, with the original idea of a day for workers to have a sense of solidarity. And the first Labor Day parade occurred September 5th, 1882 in New York. The workers' unions chose the first Monday in September because it was halfway between Independence Day and Thanksgiving. And so it was a respite from their work halfway between those holidays. And the idea spread across the country and, and some states actually designated Labor Day even before the federal government did. Then, 1894. Quick question, who was the president in 1894? Grover Cleveland, of course. He signed a law designating the first Monday in September as Labor Day. And the interesting fact is that Cleveland was not a supporter of workers. He was not a supporter of labor unions. In fact, he was trying to repair some political damage that he suffered earlier that year when he sent federal troops to put down a strike by the American Railway Union. And in that in that violent act, 34 workers were killed. So he was trying to make peace with workers. Now, so that's the end of the story from, from, from HowStuffWorks.com. But I, I think that Labor Day now carries lots less significance as a celebration of working people and, and more as an end of summer. Schools, government offices, businesses are closed on Labor Day. So people could get one last trip to the beach or head out to the lake or, or one last cook off, cookout before it gets cold. It's interesting. It's amazing 
what you can find after you do a little bit of research. And I did some searching in all sorts of different places about work, about this idea of work. And, and not surprisingly, since I'm wearing this collar and I'm standing in front of these crosses in a church, you're probably not surprised that I found some time to look into the Bible. It's a good book. You should pick it up sometime. It, it's a wise idea to discover what Scripture has to say about important things. And according to Scripture, work, the work that we are called to do falls into the category of being a very important thing. Think about this. From the beginning of time, Scripture tells us work has been a concern of God's. And so, consequently, it should be a concern of God's people. According to Scripture, work is not just a good thing. It's actually a holy thing. Think about it this way. God, the first designer, the first engineer, the first construction worker, created it all, made it all. And then after that, take a look at the story of Adam and Eve. And you'll see that God gave our first parents work to do. They were given dominion over the earth. They were called to be caretakers in the broadest possible sense. Another word is custodians. They, they were given the high and holy calling of taking care of creation on behalf of God. God put them to work. God trusted them with a job to do, and God expected them to do it. So, you may not be surprised if you read through the Old Testament and the New Testament too. Honest and good work is praised and viewed as God's intention for humanity. Daily life and work go hand in hand. Work is valued as much as idleness is condemned. However, it's important. Let me be clear about something that's also really key. The manic obsession that some of us have with work that could rightly be called workaholism, that's not blessed by God, not in the scripture. Quite the contrary, in fact, a Sabbath rest for all workers was God's idea, and Jesus taught powerfully about it too. God says that everybody needs and deserves some R&R. &R. God wants us to have that gift. That's absolutely true. So, so there's rhythm, there's rhythm of work and rest from work, work and rest from work. That's the way God made us. Now, here I am in the church, and the church, as we know, has not always been perfect. In fact, far from it. Over the course of time, the church has led people to be very, very confused about work. In fact, in the Middle Ages, particularly the leaders of the church, misinterpreted what the scripture had to say about work. And they actually said that there were two kinds of work. There was sacred work, and then there was secular or profane work. <laughs> Doing work specifically connected with the church was sacred to be a higher calling. On the other hand, work or jobs that were secular or profane, they weren't as good, to put it crassly. There was sacred work and there was secular work, and the former was better than the latter. Now, along come guys like Martin Luther and the other reformers, and they, they actually were offended by that thinking. They were offended that some were seen to be better than others because of the work they did. And as a son of a waitress who spent lots of time on her feet, waiting on people who, who really weren't always that kind to her, I got to tell you, the work that she did was every bit as hard as the stuff I do every day. And so I think the reformers were right 500 years ago, and it's right today too. We need to protest the idea that somehow one kind of work is better than other. And the truth, according to Scripture, is that honest work, all honest work done is done in service to God. And the fancy theological word for that is called vocation. Not vacation, but vocation. It's kind of a fancy word, but I think you all know what it means. Uh, there's a wonderful Christian writer I love. His name is Fred Beekner, And this is what he writes about vocation. And, and if you've not been paying attention, if you lost track, get back here, okay? Because this is really, really cool, really, really insightful. And I think it may give you a helpful place from which to think about the work that you're called to do. He writes, vocation. It comes from the Latin word vocare. Or calling. It means the work that a person is called to do by God. Like you heard Dick read a little bit while, a little while ago, he said, you are invited to do work worthy of the calling to which you are called. He says, there are all sorts of different voices calling you to all kinds of different work. And the problem is to figure out which is the voice of God 
and which is the voice of society or maybe the voice of greed or self-interest. And then Buechner says this. This is a great test. He says, by and large, a good rule for finding out what kind of work you should do is this. The kind of work that God calls you to do is the kind of work that, A, you most need to do, that you are gifted to do, and B, that the world most needs to have done. He says, if you really get a kick out of your work, you've probably met requirement A. But if your work is writing copy for cigarette ads, the chances are you've missed B. On the other hand, if you work as a doctor in a leprosy colony, you've probably met requirement B. But if most of the time you're bored and depressed by it, the chances are you have not only bypassed A, but you probably aren't helping your patients very much either. So Buechner concludes, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep need meet. What a wonderful turn of phrase. So I ask you, I ask you to ask yourself, what is God calling me to do? What work will bring me joy and meaning and in the process meet the needs of others? Now, a quick story. Um, I've had the opportunity in my work, actually, to travel to India twice with church groups, with kids and grown-ups. Remarkable time. On the second trip there, I met a man who inspired me and reminded me of that quote that I read just a minute ago, you know, about cigarette ads and, and doctors in leprosy hospitals. <laughs> While I was in India, I, I didn't meet anybody who wrote ads for cigarettes, but I did actually meet a doctor who works in a lep leprosy hospital. And I met him for the first time while I was flat on my back. At the risk of saying more than you probably want to hear, I, I had been sick, very sick, the kind of sick that travelers get for about seven days. They thought maybe I had dysentery. You don't need to mo any more of the details. Anyway, on his day off, the doctor and his wife made a call, a house call to the place where I was staying. He quickly diagnosed my dehydration, ordered some lab work, and shortly thereafter, he explained that I needed to receive intravenous fluids. And I actually resisted because one of the things that my doctor told me before I traveled to India was no needles, don't do it. And so I, I kind of minimized my illness to the doc and I, well, unintentionally implied that the techniques used in rural India might not be up to par with grace and unmistakable authority, he said, if you would like to make it back to the USA alive, you will let me do my work. <laughs> he had my attention. Over the next day or so, as I started to feel better, I began a friendship with that doctor. His name is Theodore, Christian name, Theodore. Dr. Theodore explained to me that he and his wife had served side by side along with other dedicated and faithful medical personnel seeking to eradicate leprosy in that region for over 20 years. Together, they had felt called by God to serve among the poor in rural India. Together, they discovered that God had given both the challenge and the satisfaction of doing really good work and service to those most needy. And he explained to me that no one, no one was ever turned away from treatment because of his or her poverty. And when I guess that maybe the doctor used his own resources to provide the care, he didn't confirm or deny it. He just smiled and humbly said, Pastor, God provides. Before I left his hospital, Dr. Theodore asked for my prayers and if possible, my support in his mission. And, and he promised to pray for me and for my healing and for the work I would do for Jesus among God's people upon my return home. And I have to tell you that since that experience, I, I have hoped that I could follow his example because there's no question that he understood his life as an extension of his vocation, his real calling to serve God by serving others. The vocation, the question of our own vocation, is one that many of us 
all of us actually must ask ourselves. Some believe that this question of vocation is only for the young. But I got to tell you, it's not just kids who need to figure out what they're going to do when they grow up. It's me too, because I'm still growing up. As we get older, it's increasingly important. As we age, the question we all face is, will we stagnate? and turn in on ourselves? Or, or will we find a way to contribute, to make a difference for others in the world around us? I have often said that basically there are just two kinds of people in this world. There are those who show up and those who don't. Listen, listen. God wants you to show up for work in his kingdom. Are you showing up? Will you show up? It's not just an important question. It's the question of a lifetime. And we have to ask it all the time. The question is for everybody, old or young and in between, whether you're just starting out or whether, whether you're searching for something new or whether you have a well-established work life or even if you've been retired for a dozen years, the question is still for you. Today, in the name of Jesus, I am inviting you to ask yourself a question. Ask yourself this. What is God calling me to do with my life? Or put it like this. What meaningful work may go undone if I do not do it? Ask yourself, in the face of this pandemic, ask yourself, am I being called to befriend someone who's lonely? Am I being called to reach out to the neighbor kid or, or, or give my blood to the Red Cross? Am I being called to offer myself in the local mission of Ruth's house or support the Hope Center? Or is God leading me to reach out in this community for the sake of the poor or the marginalized or for those who are discriminated against? Think about it. But in the meantime, in the meantime, listen. If you're a grandparent or a parent, Fulfill that vocation with joy and eagerness. Don't give up on your kids. Even if this distance learning stuff is driving you crazy, even if you don't know exactly what to do, make sure you love their ki your kids, especially when they're most unlovable. And if you're a student about ready to turn return to school, choose to do your best in a crazy situation. Don't just slide by and do the least you can get by with. Apply yourself and learn as much as you can about as many things if you, as you can. If you are an employee or an employer, appreciate the task that the other does and then do yours honorably and well. If you are retired, find a way to share your experience and wisdom with those of us who still have a lot to learn. And be patient with us because sometimes we already think we know everything that we need to know. <laughs> if you're a singer, sing your song beautifully. If you're a listener, pick up the phone and call somebody who needs to talk. If you're an organizer, put something meaningful together. If you're a dreamer, dream big. If you are able to help somebody, somebody who really needs you, do it. Why not today? What's stopping you? Today, I invite you for the sake of God to ask yourself these questions. What is God calling me to do? What important thing won't get done unless I do it? What work will bring joy and meaning to my life and in the process make a difference in someone else's? Today, I pray that you will hear the calling that St. Paul gave in that lesson earlier. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And I pray that invitation would be at the forefront of your mind and in the depths of your heart. And I pray that by God's grace, you will have the wisdom and courage to answer that call every day of your life. <laughs> Starting today, the day before Labor Day. And let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus, who gives us important work to do in the kingdom. Help us to discover what it is that you want us to do, to know what is done in your name is never in vain, and to believe that in following your son, we will be given work that is blessing to others and meaningful to us. Help us to lead lives worthy of the calling to which we're called. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we are grateful that we can always come to you in our prayers, that you are always ready to listen because you love us. Help us to realize as your children that we will always be your beloved, that we will always be your chosen ones. And then, Lord, based on that confidence and that promise, help us to do what you call us to do, to figure out your voice in this world and what it's inviting us 
to do so we can make a difference in this world for your sake and for the sake of others. And in the process, experience the real joy of meaning and purpose in life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, Lord God, we pray for our world, a world that's often dark, a place that needs light. We believe that you call us to let our light shine in this world, and we pray that that might indeed happen because of each person who is worshiping today and because of our church and because of the church of Jesus Christ in this whole world. We pray for light in the darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are dispossessed, those who are homeless, those who are hungry, those who are lost, those who are struggling just to make ends meet. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless them with your presence and your peace and that you might continue to use us, the members of your church, and good people everywhere to attend to those who need us the most. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today for those who are facing the reality of the civil unrest in our nation. We pray for those who seek to keep order, those who work in every form of law enforcement, those who are first responders, those who work in the fields of medicine, those who try to keep things together when it seems like they're falling apart. And we pray also for those who are trying to have their voices be heard. None of us condones violence, Lord, but we know that sometimes we need to speak loudly so that voices can be heard. Help us all to listen to the cries of injustice. Help us to make this world a better place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for, for this earth, for, for this marvelous gift of creation. We're grateful for the beauty, the bounty we see in the fields in this area. And we pray for the farmers and those who tend the land that this might be a good and safe harvest. We pray also for those who are facing the reality of natural disasters those who have lost their homes, their livelihoods because of storms, because of other realities in this world. We pray, good Lord, for your peace in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, Lord, we pray especially for those who carry heavy burdens, those who are struggling with depression or addiction or other forms of illness. Today, we think especially of those who are facing the reality of this COVID virus, Give them strength and courage and hope and healing. There are people in our own community, in our own church right now, who are facing this reality. And we pray that you would bless them and keep them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, gracious God, help us to pause for a moment, to seek your voice, to listen to your call, and come to you in our own prayers silently. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, all of these things and everything else you see that we need, grant them. For we are bold to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. In just a few moments, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, what's going to happen now is Mark and Mike will share some music. And during this time, we would invite you to prepare your table for the Lord's Supper. All you need is some wine or grape juice, a little bit of bread, and hopefully you were aware of the fact that we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. If you need to, pause this recording so you can set your table. Do it with a sense of joyfulness and a sense of reverence, knowing that in just a moment we will share the gift that God gives to us in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. So we say thanks to Mark and to Mike as they lead us in this song. And we pause to prepare our hearts for this reception of the Lord's Supper. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity one may be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, and no, we Christians by our love. We will walk with each other 
This time, I invite you to center yourself, take a breath, and remember the story of God's grace as it's revealed in the person of Jesus. Jesus, who gathered together with his friends in that upper room, who recreated the celebration of the Passover into a new thing, a promise of life in this world and life in the next, where Jesus literally took upon himself the sins of this world and became the new Passover lamb so that we might be passed over because of our sins and given the grace of God that we so desperately need. You know the story. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with those friends. He took bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks for that and gave it for them to drink. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, when we share this bread, it's the body of Christ. When we drink this wine, we say that it is the blood of Christ. At this time, I would invite you to serve one another using the words, this is the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, if there is someone or a young child who would receive a blessing, simply touch their forehead and say, Jesus loves you now and forever. And maybe make the sign of the cross. If you're alone, if you're celebrating this supper, remember that none of us are ever alone. We believe that all of the saints in heaven and earth are gathered around this great banqueting table. And so as you serve yourself, say, this is the body of Christ, the blood of Christ given and shed for me. Now we'll have a little bit of music and we'll ask you to serve one another and then we will continue with our service.
now, may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen us and keep us in his grace, both now and forever. Amen. And let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life, and this precious wine, which is your blood, to nourish your people and free us from fear. Send us forth now as witnesses, as people who answer your call, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Now, lift up your hearts and receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, worship has ended. Let the service begin. Thanks be to God. Amen. And thanks again to Mark and Paula and Mike for their music. Build your kingdom here. Come set to rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, until why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are the church. We need your power in our Yes.